or that I'm going to add some to. Uh, then I'm going to introduce each one of the panelists. Uh, they're going to give a brief bio on themselves and uh, where they're at on their, their journey in life. And then we're going to open it to question and answers. You're given uh, cards on your way in. You can either step to the microphone and ask a question, or you can uh, give the cards to Jim. He'll get them to me, and we'll ask the questions. Uh, first off, Roxy's room wants to thank Dodd for putting together the PowerPoint, uh, all these statistics. Uh, the set. This afternoon, I went over some, uh, some, a few more statistics. Uh, it's estimated that over 15,000 transgender people serve in the U.S. military right now since the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. 35% um, of adolescent trans kids have attempted suicide. And that's too many. That's 35% too many. That's five times higher than all ad adolescents that were surveyed if they'd ever done bodily harm, tried to injure yourself, kill yourself. Uh, one in 10,000 transgender people are male to female. We were supposed to have a uh, female to male transgender panelist here today, but they uh, were unable to make it. So today we have Roxanne, who's from Meridian, Mississippi, now lives in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm her partner of 20 some odd years. said that in such a negative way. Uh, then we have Elaine Stevens. Elaine was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, moved to Alabama in 1979. Uh, Elaine has got a good pedigree. She received an undergraduate degree from the University of Louisville and a master's in accounting from UAB. Elaine is retired from Bell South and later served as controller and chief financial officer of three companies in the Birmingham area. Is a CPA, certified management accountant, and has practiced at three accounting firms in Birmingham and was an accounting consultant before completely retiring in 2012. And Elaine has a story to tell. Elaine just uh, went through the complete reassignment surgery. Uh, then we have Tasha Touche. She's legendary here in Birmingham. She's originally from Childersburg, Alabama. Uh, she's been in Birmingham for about 100 years, but no. Seriously, Tasha is a sweetheart. And then we also have uh, Vicky from Cologne, Germany. Uh, Vicky's been in Alabama for 17 years, and Vicky's an engineer at Mercedes and uh, is openly welcomed by most people on her job. I'll let Roxanne go ahead and take over. Okay. How's everybody doing? Okay. I'm going to give you just a little briefing on letting you know how Roxy began and how it all got started and everything and how it come about. Well, actually, it started, I'll say, when we were in Meridian. Well, I'm going to start to give you the story of that first. So anyhow, I'm, a, I'm from a family of 11, um, from a family of pastors. My grandfather was a pastor. My um, Dad was a pastor, my uncle was a pastor, and my brother's a pastor. And they were Holy Ghost, Baptist, you know, liberals. And that's where I'm from, and the family of 11. I was openly gay, and um, y'all hear me? Okay, I was openly gay. At that time, they didn't have transgender this or transgender that. They didn't have labels for everything. It was just, you were gay. So at that time, in the early 90s, I just said I was gay, but I did, I had a fascination with makeup, and I had a fascination with um, women's attire. I had a fascination with being the, a fabulous woman. So I started going to the bars and stuff, and I started meeting all my friends and stuff, and I met them at the bars, and I started doing shows, and it was like an all-white bar. It was kind of run by the clans also. And, <laughs> and I met this wonderful man here. He was married, and we got together, and 
he told me, he said, don't worry. He said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you everything you ever wanted out of life. And I'd heard that story many, many times before from all the other guys. But it was just something different when he told me. And I listened to him. I was like, hmm, he sounds promising. He sounds like he could be something good in my life. So we got together. Two months later, he left his wife, uh, moved me in, ship, shipped her out. We, and um, <laughs> well, that's the way it was. I moved in, his two kids, they became my stepkids. They, they loved me, but not at the beginning. They were kind of, you know, rude and everything. But in time, they got to like me and, you know, we became close. And I met all my other friends, my other sisters, like myself, that were transgender also. And like I said at the time, gay. And um, anyway, we got together and we started hanging out and we were talking about statistics about disease and different things. We had heard, you know, AIDS hadn't really come out that strong yet. We were talking about that. And um, they were like, you know, it's, it's the gay man's cancer. And it does this and it's doing that. And, you know, we were talking about it and whatnot. Baby, give me some water. I got the potty mouth. Anyway, we were talking about that. And, um, Later on that year, one of my friends got really, really, really sick. And she told us, she said, um, she wanted us to come see her in the hospital. So we went to see her, and she told us she was dying. And we were like, dying? You know, what do you mean? And she told us that she had AIDS. And she told us, now before that she had told us, she said, always put you some socks on your feet. Always keep your feet covered up. In the wintertime, she said, because it keeps, you know, you from catching colds and this, that, and the other. She said, always do that. And we were like, oh, my God. You know, she said, I'm dying soon, and we won't, I want y'all to come to my funeral. Me and her, we come out the same time. We, right after we graduated, we come out with a, with a bang. We were in full drag, and we were like sisters. But when she told me that, I was like, I just can't believe this. This is my best friend. She's dying. And um, to make a long story short, she lived for about, a lo about another year. And um, then she passed, and we all went to her funeral. Slowly but surely, every one of my friends, back to back to back, started dying. And I was like, you know, we didn't have an outlet. We didn't have a place to talk to about our issues that everybody go through day to day. We didn't have anybody to talk to about death or you know, suffering or, you know, just, tr just anything. Like, we didn't have anybody to, to talk to. And it was like, we were really depressed and we became, some of, them, some of us became drug addicts, some of us were drinkers. I drank, I'm not gonna lie. And it got really, really hard. And um, like I said, within a two, but if within a two year period, all eight of my friends had died. And thank God for looking out for me because I always had me a, you know, a partner. I always, so my mom used to always tell me, keep you, if she said, I don't approve of your lifestyle, I don't approve of what you're doing, but I always keep you somebody near you, and keep you somebody with you, you know, so you can stay out of trouble. I'm not gonna lie, I was rebellious and wild before that, and when we got together, we started, you know, that slowed me down when I was in a relationship, and so. <clears throat> Anyway, along came this man after I lost my friends and stuff, and I was like, I was like out of my mind. I was depressed. I was like, I'm, you know, I just want to die. I just feel so bad because all my friends are gone. And I met him, and he came along at the right time, and he told me, he said, baby, you don't have to worry about anything. He said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you whatever you want, all the things you want. He said, whatever surgeries or whatnot. So we started, you know. Like I said, shipped his wife out. We got my surgeries and stuff I had that I, that I wanted. And then he told me, he said, um, what would you like, do you want to start over again? Do you want to go somewhere different and start over, go somewhere else, and start a new beginning? And I told him, I said, why not? Well, we just kind of put names in the in head and kind of shook it up, you know, and tossed it and everything. And said, but before that, We had got together 
and I had one the first one Miss Crossroads. That was the name of the bar. I forgot to tell you that. Miss Crossroads, then I won Miss Entertainer of the Year, then I won Miss Calendar Girl, and I was just like on a roll. And I was like, okay, we need to go somewhere else so I can start over and blah, blah, blah. And so we come to Alabama. And I was telling John, I was like, I want to start a ministry that's dedicated to my friends that are lost and gone right now. Something to, to, to you know, to, to commemorate my friends that are gone. And um, he said, why don't you start a ministry, you know, get some kind of ministry started. Okay, at that time we were not in a church, so um, I think I met Diane at the park, Diane Armstrong. She was at the park one night, and she told me, she said, Roxanne, she said she told us about the church and everything, she told us about the pastor JR, and this was at the old church, so, um, I went to JR and I talked to him. I told him about my friends and about wanting to do something for dedication for my friends and commemoration. Plus, you know, it's a lot of kids out there that are gay that don't have an outlet. My group is like an outlet for them to come to and to discuss their issues because a lot of kids, they don't have anybody to talk to. They commit suicide. They um, end up on the streets, you know, well, you know, Committing suicide is the worst, but you know, on the streets or whatever. And so I was like, I told him about, about it, and he was like, well, Roxanne, why don't you start a ministry here? I said, really? A ministry like that at your church? He said, yeah. He said, and why don't you call it Roxy's Room? Mind you, I did not think of that name, you all. JR thought of that name. And I said, Roxy's Room, really? So I was like, that's, that's kind of catchy. So we started the group at the old church. We didn't have that many members. It was Tasha, myself, and Victoria. We were the only tranny girls. And I said, well, we need to do something to make this expand. Because for the first three years, it was kind of kind of lame. So I started reaching out to the gay community, telling them about it as well, about it with their job situations, about it with the, the prejudice and stuff that we have to go through with, and just different topics and different issues. So I, di I discussed all of that. My group has grown now through the years. I have like 10 to 20, sometimes 30, sometimes 40 people at my group. And it's open to any and everybody, not just transgenders, but transgenders, you know, gay, lesbian, you know, whatever is welcome. And that's how Roxy began. Voila. Good afternoon, thank you for coming. I'm Elaine Stevens. Uh, I was originally from Louisville, Kentucky. I've been here in Alabama since 1979. You can do the math. What, 36 years nearly. Uh, my earliest memory of something being different was about at age five and a half when I came home from kindergarten. I came home crying and my mother, um, who was a stay-at-home mom, said, um, well, what was the matter? And I said, well, I didn't get to wear dresses like all the other, a dress like all the other little girls. Now, she either didn't hear the word other, she didn't pick up on it, it scared her to death, I, I don't know, but uh, you have to understand, uh, Roxy mentioned the Klan. My daddy was an FBI agent. He was hunting the Klan, and, and, um, and um, army deserters and whatever. But uh, So that's the kind of family I grew up in. We were Southern Baptists, uh, never missed going to church on Sunday. As I look at these statistics that are running up on the um, on these screens, you see, I can't personally identify with any of those. I got through um, junior high school and high school, and I did what most transgenders do. I got into my mother's clothes, at least up through junior high school. By high school, I couldn't fit in her clothes. But that was only, of course, when she, after she had gone back to work, 
and um, and maybe I was uh, got to stay home from school for illness or whatever. But the minute the minute she and my daddy were gone, I I I got dressed up. Now I call those stolen moments. I've had many of those throughout my life, and if I ever get around to finishing the book that I'm trying to write, that's the name of it. Remember that, because I would like for you to buy it. But uh, I got into, um, I w I, into the University of Louisville School of Dentistry. And I had a little bit of time on my hands, not much, but a little, and I went over to the University of Louisville Medical School Library and I started trying to find out what, what was going on, what has gone on in my life. I looked up the word transvestite. Um, I looked for whatever, whatever I could tie together, and all of a sudden I found the word transsexual. Now, transgender wasn't even a word back then that people recognized, and I'm not going to tell you when that was because girls don't always tell their age. But, the, um, but I read about probably the most renowned transsexual, and that was Christine Jorgensen. And she, she went to uh, Sweden and had, quote, a sex change. Today we call that gender reassignment surgery. But that was in 1953. And... Um, and that's not when I, that, I did, that hadn't just happened when I found it, by the way. But the, uh, as, I, as I looked into what was going on in my life, I thought, well, what am I going to do? Because you see, I was already married, I already had a child, I was trying to become a dentist. Well, that didn't work out because I just didn't have the money to stay in school. But I made up my mind that I would just take that information that I found, kind of store it in a box and put it on the back shelf or the closet, and just survive in the body that I was given. Because you know, when I grew up, I was told little boys don't cry, and little boys can't wear dresses, and little boys have to play ball, and, and these things that, that really People that have never experienced it cannot understand it. So I went to work for the telephone company out of college. I had a great career. I was able to retire at a fairly young age. And John read the bio. I've done a lot of things since I retired from the phone company. But I've had three marriages. Two of them ended because of this. The other one did not. It, it ended because of infidelity, but not on my part. And two years ago, my third wife found my private journal that I had been keeping for some time and writing as a woman. And uh, she looked at that and immediately declared that the marriage was over. And what you have to understand is, all through life, I woke up in the morning realizing that something was not right. I went to bed at night realizing it. And all during the day, I realized it. And I prayed to be different when I woke up the next morning. Two years ago, I guess those prayers were answered kind of in a in a way that I had never anticipated because I thought that I would carry this secret to my grave. And I was willing to do that. I would not have traded my wife's happiness for my happiness for anything. I told my therapist that. Well, I guess what it, what it says to me now is that all those prayers, they, they didn't go unanswered. It was just not yet. But two years ago, she found the journal. She left. Now, I will add, she and I are the best of, she is my very best friend in life. We shop together. We lunch together. We talk to each other every day. And it's, uh, she, 
when, when, when I have to go out of town for something, she comes over and stays at my home and takes care of my pets. That's a pretty good friend to have. But that wasn't a very good weekend, that weekend she found that journal. But you see, she prayed. She asked for compassion. And during a, a brief stay out of town, she did a little research on the internet and she found found out what she wanted to know about transgenders. And when she came back, she, she asked, it was a Sunday morning, and she said, can I ask you some questions? I said, well, yeah, I don't have any secrets anymore. And even though it was only one secret I had kept from her, it was kind of big. But uh, four hours later, she quit asking me questions. And she had tears rolling down her face thinking about, what I had told her about what my life had been. Now, don't get me wrong. I said, I didn't fall in to those statistics. I had a good life. I survived. So it's been, that's, that was just, just a few days short, a little, few days, a little over two years ago that that happened. But when she left, I made up my mind that I could never, ever go back I had to move forward. I had to become the person that I had been all my life. I just couldn't uh, let re be reflected. And I made up my mind then that I would transition. I told my children, since that time, I have had no, no or very little contact with my children. I don't get to see my grandchildren. I told my siblings. My siblings consider me dead. See, there's people that think this is choice. But we don't choose those kind of things. I made my choice many years ago, and that was to raise my family, take care of my job, have, have the career, just, just be what outwardly it, it looked like I was. Last August, I was fortunate enough and I went to Philadelphia, and I completed my transition. I live to, thank you. I'm extremely happy with who I am today. I'm sad about my children, and I pray daily that reconciliation and restoration can come back. Uh, only, only time and you know who controls time, our Heavenly Father. I do have contact with my oldest granddaughter. As a matter of fact, I had a text from her right after I got here just telling me she loved me. And, uh, you know, that, that, that keeps you going. So, life is good. It's tough. And when you read those statistics, it's tougher for most. I'm a little bit... I wasn't privileged from the standpoint my father was just a civil servant. But I made my way in life, and I survived. And today, I am fulfilled. And that means the world to me. Thank you. Hello. I'm your legendary Tasha Touche. <laughs> Well, uh, like many of you, I can uh, identify with your stories because I look, I'm looking at the similarities and not the differences. At an early age, I can realize that I was different. I was born in Chillersburg, Alabama, but I never known my mother and father to live together as husband and wife. But today I know who my father is and all. And we have a very good relationship, very good. And uh, as I was growing up, feeling that I was different, I always felt that I was born in the wrong body. I felt that I should have been a female. I felt like a female born in a male's body. 
although I never questioned or said anything about how I felt when I got old enough and feelings began to occur and stuff, I just reacted on how I felt. And uh, I have other siblings, four brothers, three sisters, and most of those brothers are ministers today. But I have, they have no problem with me being who I am today. And uh, looking back over parts of my life, with me being who I am, I think a lot of the name calling, words that I had to hear people call me, really hurted me, and it drove me to drugs and alcohol. Drinking, drugging, trying to fit in. Because anywhere that I felt all right, that's where I would be. But thank God that's not me today. And uh, after doing that for a long time and looking back at my mother, I can remember when my mother used to tell me, I done told you, you cannot be one of those. Because at an early age, I want to feel like, see how it felt to wear women clothes. So one day I dressed up, put the clothes, put the makeup on, I put the makeup on, put the clothes on the back porch, went out the front door, got into the clothes, went to the neighborhood, uh, to the neighborhood club. Had a good time, and so I felt accepted there. So I kept on doing this for a long time. Then again, my mama told me, uh, look at that young man right there. Look how he is. He's not like you. A lot of times I wanted to tell her he didn't supposed to be like me because <laughs> he was mine. But in those days, you didn't talk like that to your parents like children do today. But on and on, uh, as time went on, I got drafted into the Army. I spent 18 months in the Army. I've been through the Job Corps. And I didn't stay in the Army that long because at the day that I got signed up, it was brought to their attention that I was gay. And they asked me that uh, I want them to flag my orders and stay there on that, stay there at that at the station, or go to my next duty station. This was right after basic training, and I told them with all the stuff that I done been through, I think you owe me the ride to the next duty station. <laughs> So I went to the next duty station. And that morning when we got there, I saw a lot of queens go marching across the field. Nobody was as open as I was. As far as it being a closet, I don't think I've ever been in a closet. I don't think I've ever been in a closet. I've just been, just been me to some point. Was going to church and all this kind of stuff. and. Uh, Getting back to the army, where as I saw these queens, I didn't tell the people anything when I got there. I stayed there until me and this guy got hooked up, and we got to acting as if we were at home, just walking across cold, cold hands, hugged <laughs> up with each other, as if, as if we were not in the army, and now. Uh, at that time, they cut orders on me for Korea, and then they cut orders on him for somewhere else, and I haven't seen him since. <laughs> <laughs> but then finally, my paperwork caught up with me, and then they processed me out over in Korea. But I thank God for the time that I had in there, because 
it afforded me to get everything today that they owe to me. And I'm very grateful out there. And uh, after I come home from the Army, I left, uh, I spent the night at home because my mother was very unaccepting and drinking and stuff, and uh, my mother told me if I wanted to drink and do this kind of stuff, uh, I had to stay somewhere else. So I packed up and left the next morning and went back to Columbus, Georgia. When I come back, I was a brand new me. Long red hair, all the fingernails. <laughs> And uh, my mother asked me, she said, well, what done happened to you? I say, nothing happened. But I stayed at home for a while. My mother had remarried again, and we had moved to Birmingham with my stepfather, which was a minister also, which whom by being mistreated so by him, I grew to hate him. I mean, I hated him with a personal passion. And one day he told my mom that uh, I could no longer stay with them. And then that made me suffer with abandonment issues. It made me kind of be angry with my mom simply because of the fact that she chose what a man wanted her to do over doing what was best for her child. But as time passed, I got all right with that and then went on about my business and began to live on my own and stuff. And after getting sprung out of stuff on the drugs and stuff. I stopped going to church. I stopped doing a whole lot of stuff that I used to do. After going to a treatment center and listening to some stuff, doing some work on me, most of all, put a God in my life. And you know, I've always wanted to go to one of them churches where I could put on my little suit, my big, my big wide hats and stuff, and be that lady and just walk in there and be all right. But you know that wasn't going to happen in the Baptist church. <laughs> 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 Nor was that going to happen in the Catholic church, because I've been to both of them. <laughs> but I met this lady as I was in the treatment of that came to church here. And she asked me to come to her church one Sunday. She said, it doesn't matter how you come, you can come any way that you want. I painted up the little face, put on the little old pants outfit with the little demon things on and came here. And I don't know, coming here gave me a sense of freedom. It was just like, chains and bondage. I was out of bondage. A lot of stuff had been lifted. And after being in the NA program and coming to this church and looking at things today, today I know what I am, who I am, what I will do, and most of all, whose I am. And I'm real grateful for that today. So therefore, I will thank this church for accepting me, for letting me be who I am today. And most of all, I am all right with me today, no matter how nobody else feels. Talk to somebody else because I'm all right with me. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Vicky Rosbock. I am, as you can hear, I'm German, or I've heard from John. Uh, I'm 61 years old, and uh, believe it or not, I came out at the beginning of last year. 
Okay, I will speak about me quite frankly, so hopefully you stay with me. <coughs> I was born in a time, so early 50s in Germany, and at that time in Germany we had a um, special law. It was the law 175, which says that anybody who, sh uh, who, is, uh, who is homosexual or lesbian and shows any intimacy in public goes to jail. That is the environment. It, this law lasted till the middle of the 70s. So I was basically already 20 years old. My father was very dominant. He was a good father, but he was very dominant. He had resisted the Nazis. He never joined the Nazis. I have five sisters and one brother. I'm the second youngest. So as Elaine mentioned somehow, so she recognized something is different with uh, five and a half years. In my case, it was quite similar. I was six. So we made, made a play um, where we had to dress up and I had the role of playing a mother. Guess what? It felt like, how can I describe this the easiest way? If you have a sticky room, it's warm, it's winter time, and then somebody opens the window and the fresh air comes in from outside, it feels like all of a sudden you can breathe. And I felt very comfortable. We made the play, and of course then we stopped, and then one of my aunt, uh, aunts and my mother was there, and they said, okay, that was very nice. Now, Shark, go get changed, change yourself. It's ridiculous. Okay, you can imagine, I know, okay, that doesn't work. So over the years, um, Naya, how do you say, um, as my pre-speaker said, you have the urge, you want to dress, let's say you want to wear a skirt, you want to wear a dress, you want to wear something else. So um, my youngest sister, so is she is uh, two years younger than me, she helped me a little bit. I lived or I slept in the basement, I mean a real basement. In Europe you have real basements, which are under earth. So my room was under the basement. And you could reach my room where I slept over another room, so it was enclosed. So in the other room, there were a bunch of cabinets with old clothes from the Second World War. So in my urge, I tried to dress. Of course, never let anybody know that I wanted to do that. And of course, it was all stuff, old stuff from the Second World War, something not something nice. So after a while, I asked my younger sister, can you help me a little bit? And she did for a while. And then, of course, she said, why are you doing this? What's wrong? I have to speak with the parents. And so I said, no, 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 okay, you don't have to do this anymore. I, I, I don't need this anymore. So I had to stop that. So I had to do this again with what I found in the cabinets. And I had to be aware that every second, one of my siblings or my parents could come in. So I, as you said, you could walk freely. I had no chance. I was so scared. I was dressing up, s staying in my bed, and something like, oh, God, God, God. Why, well, hopefully nobody sees me like that. Anyhow, so that was the time, the time when I was growing up. It's becoming, uh, getting into puberty. Puberty was basically not existing. Um, my mother developed, let's say, she became alcoholic and uh, made pseudo suicide basically every, let's say, six weeks or eight weeks. Which you can imagine is a lot of fun having a mother who is drunken and committing suicide, so I couldn't go to her. My father was dominant. So here I am becoming, let's say, coming in puberty, 14, 15, 16. And why all of a sudden do I feel I would like to have a period? Why do I get jealous about my sisters they were a significant older. My older sister is 14 years older. Why do I get jealous? Because I can have kids. So one day, one evening, I tried to speak with my father. I was around about 16, and I was completely confused how I felt about girls. Something wasn't right. I didn't feel the appropriate about girls. I found I, I felt empathy. So I didn't know what to do else, so I asked my father, and he absolutely didn't get it. 
he was bragging about it, uh, himself and how good he was when he was young and all the girls came to him and worshipped him and so on. I said, oh God. So I said, okay, you cannot speak, you can neither speak with your mother and you can also not speak with your father and also your siblings. So I kept my mouth shut. I didn't tell anybody, I had nobody to speak about. And as Elaine already said, it was even worse in Germany, the expression transgender didn't exist, wasn't invented yet. And why do I feel like this? Why do I have these female urges sometimes? It was not spontaneous, it was from like, like a wave. It was going away and coming tr with the force back sometimes. So I had a lot of girlfriends. I now also married three times. But I must say that I always, I always gave the reason that a relationship broke up. My marriages broke up of because of me and my relationships to my girlfriends broke up. I thought, I, w I knew I was not homosexual. And I thought my uh, attraction to, to girls would be heterosexual, but it was actually only emphasis. Some girls actually, for example, I remember a few times they, um, they asked me, hey, can I put makeup on you? Can we dress up a little bit? So somehow I must have behaved, even I tried not to, I must have behaved a little bit feminine, so I want to do that. I never liked soccer. I never liked baseball, any of these ball games. I loved dancing. And I was always jealous when I was dancing that the girls could do the nice moves and could wear the dresses. And believe it or not, this says something different than this one. So this thing down there, which doesn't belong to me, was making itself independent. And I was so ashamed. So you can imagine when this said something, I was doing the duck dancing. Instead of moving towards the girl, I was moving away from the girl, that she would never recognize that I had an erection. I was so ashamed. When I was waiting, we have a lot of public transportation. When I was waiting for the bus, for the next bus, and I saw a nice dressed woman, and I was thinking about, okay, this could be a little bit different. Maybe, what, what, no, she should have something different, fashion. Or how, and I was thinking about, how would I look in this? Hey, how voice is coming from? Yeah? Why do you think about how you would look into that? Yeah? And then I got also, honestly, I got a stiff here. I said, God, this is ashaming. So I turned around. I was so ashamed of myself. Just, let's see, it happened down there. And I was so confused about, why do you think like this? Yeah? So I had a lot of girlfriends, and as I said before, I was always giving the root cause that it failed. Twice, I tried to behave like a man, to be mature, and like this, like a male, and I felt miserable, miserably. So all the other times I was intimate with the, uh, with the woman was when I always imagined I am a girl, so I could only get excited not thinking I'm a man, I also got excited when I am a woman. So I feel comfort, I always felt comfortable with the foreplay, a long foreplay. And this finally, okay, you can put your whatever you have down there. Into, is, yeah, okay, it's, is it necessary? Okay, it's necessary, she expects that. That was not the, you know, I, I didn't, I couldn't care less, let's say it this way. So anyhow. Um, my friends, my male friends, loving soccer and all these other games, of course, you know, Europe and Germany is famous in soccer. They watch the um, European Championship, World Championship, so, and of course, their girlfriends were pretty bored. So what did I do? I said, hey, can we go? So I took care about their girlfriends. I mean, literally, I took care. I didn't do anything with them. We just had a good time. We were going shopping. We were going eating ice cream. We had a good time. We may be watching a movie. And they knew nothing would happen for whatever reason. I didn't know. Probably they felt it. So I got married with my first wife, German. And um, 
um, having a mother who was alcoholic, I did think I could handle her because she was also alcoholic. So it was quite nasty, so sometimes, because I was twice, I was in a boot and called for help, mental help for me. Anyhow, we got divorced after eight years because she got sidetracked because I couldn't sleep with her, as you can imagine why. So after her, I had my favorite girlfriend, her name is Sonia, and we were for around about six years together, and then one day she said, you have to go. You have to go. I said, why do I have to go? What do I do wrong? I don't know. Something is something doesn't fit. You have to go. She never explained it. Of course, you can imagine now or know what it is, but she could really, she couldn't explain it. So I had to go back. We lived outside Stuttgart. So I had to go back to Stuttgart and live for the next one and a half, two years in Stuttgart in a, an apartment home, an apartment. Um, feeling extremely lonely and didn't know what to do. So I thought, I have to go, I have to somehow seek, I want to be with women. I feel much more comfortable with anybody, but I want to have women. So what I did is, you have, we have prostitutes in Germany, and prostitution in Germany is legal. Prostitutes pay insurance, prostitutes pay tax. So I went to prostitutes on a regular basis. So the first few times I tried it, it was always a disaster, absolute disaster. So there was nothing male. So I said, okay, this doesn't work. So then I started to deviate. I used the prostitutes to speak with them. So I paid 200 bucks per hour that I had a chance to speak with the woman. And they always were very suspicious up front. After about, after around about a quarter of an hour, I realized he doesn't really want to, to sleep with me. He really wants to speak. So they opened up, so I had at least, let's say, 45 minutes to speak with him. But you can imagine 200 bucks for one hour is a lot of money. So then I changed to hostess service. So I asked a non-erotic hostess service. So that was a better deal. So I had to pay more for the day, but overall it was more let's say, relaxing and fulfilling because then we met somewhere in downtown Stuttgart and it was obviously that is not erotic, so we had a good time, we spoke. And basically after 12 hours or so, of course, she w was then leaving me, going to her car or whatsoever, and maybe we ate lunch and we ate supper or something like this, so you can imagine quite a lot of effort. So anyhow, after one and a half years being so extreme lonely, I got the call, hey, you have a chance to go to the United States as an expatriate, as an expert here from Mercedes. I said, yes, here I am. I volunteered to come here to Alabama. Uh, have a fresh start, do everything is completely different, language different, you do also something what you haven't done before, so I started here in Tuscaloosa. And of course, I was looking for company. And then, Ah, before I continue with that, a few, a few months before I flew to America, I saw a movie, and you probably know, some of you know this. The movie is called Switch. It is with Alan Barkin. It actually should be a funny movie. Up in my case, it was not so funny, because in the last scene, Alan Barkin is actually playing um, a former man who was killed by his girlfriend because he was so nasty, and then the devil and uh, God decided to give him a female body, and he has to find a female who loves her. Otherwise, he really has to go to hell. So anyhow, she slowly transmits, then become more and more female, and finally gives birth to a little baby girl. And while she gives birth, she dies because she knew this, she has diabetes. And I was crying my butt out in the movie theater. And the next week I was again in the movie and cried my butt out. I said, why are you crying your butt out? Why do you are so jealous that she can have a baby? So anyhow, I come now to America and then I see another movie. The movie you also can see now is called Second Surf. 
and the main actress is Vanessa Redgrave. Vanessa Redgrave uh, plays the role, the role of Rene Richards. Rene Richards still lives. She is in Great Britain. She is the official first transgender here from America. Rene Richards, as maybe you have heard her name, is, uh, was a very famous amateur tennis player and an eye doctor. So I see this report on TV her doing the transition and was first, the first few minutes I was shocked about the openness and then I see, God, she plays me. She plays me. And I said, if you do this, you cannot tell anybody not what you are. They will ridicule you, they will laugh you. If you go to any psychologist, they show you the door. So don't let anybody ever see or feel or hear what you are. So I basically made a vote to myself, like Elaine said it earlier, to take it to my grave. Nobody should ever know what you are. So I had uh, my second marriage with my first American wife, which then ended after five years. And um, then I met my last wife, and um, which is wonderful, we had a very wonderful marriage. And she spoke then while we were dating, she spoke about um, one of her previous partners. At that time, I lived in an apartment in Tuscaloosa, and you can guess I had bought several women's clothes, and I was then, for comfort, I was dressing in, on a regular basis in this women's clothes, never outside, never in public, but just to have a few, few hours of comfort to feel relaxed. So, okay, imagine that. So she speaks about one of her previous partners and says she saw him one day in the gallery, so pretty up-to-date, uh, completely cross-dressed, and she was absolutely disgusted about him. And then she told me also in detail what sexual practices he liked to do with her. I do not go in detail. Anyhow, now imagine me. I know I want to wear women's clothes, and I know that I am transgender, and then my my friend, my, my later my, 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 my third wife, says how disgusted she was about somebody wearing women's clothes. So I said, okay, if I tell her anything about myself, she makes a U-turn and I will never see her again. So I didn't say anything. And you must know that people like us always hope that a loving relationship will compensate for what we have. Only very, very few have an iron will and can survive without having a loving relationship. We all hope that over the time that the urge, what we want to do, can be somehow can, can be compensated by the, the love of our partner. So I was hoping this would work for me too again, third time. So I didn't say anything. Okay, I would have succeeded. I would not have done anything. I would not have told her and she would never recognize. Then following things happen. Six years ago, I, um, I hadn't slept with her already, let's say, for a while. You can imagine why. So I was in, the, in my company and I had a supervisor, senior manager, was quite ugly sometimes. So a lot of people had already left the department, so four of them. And I was several times already in HR because of him. So one day, one morning, he did something for a student, something very nice. And it was not about me, it was about the student. And so all of a sudden I see myself as a young woman in a mini dress standing on my tiptoes, reaching up to him, putting my arms around his neck and to give him a kiss on his cheeks, just as a woman says, thank you, you have did great. It was extreme extense, and then I recognized after, I don't know, a second or two, of course I was not this young woman, but I was standing already on tiptoes. Of course, I stepped down, and she looked a little bit weird to me, and I grabbed, we have furniture, which is so 
metal, so sheet metal furniture, so industrial grade. So I grabbed this furniture, pressed as hard as I could, I pressed with both hands about the edges just to feel pain. It didn't bleed, but it was pain enough to bring me back to reality. So I made it then somehow tumbled back to my desk and sit there. The only thing I can remember, I saw it was daylight. I saw some light. I couldn't recognize anything. But internally, my mind was running 100 miles an hour because I was, in that few seconds, I was that woman. I wanted to be with every cell of my body. I wanted to be this, this girl. I wanted to be nothing else. And then, I don't know if it was a second, a few seconds, or was a few minutes, then of course I came back to reality. But I said, okay, you have to make a decision. The decision was going again in the wrong, as some times earlier, going in the wrong direction. I consulted a urologist and said, I need to have more, I want to know have more testosterone to save my marriage. So I got the test. The test came back after a few days. Um, I was 40 points below the minimum of a man. A normal male has between 180 and 750. I had 140. Voila, here you have the reason. Give me testosterone. No, sir. Why not? Your PSA value, and the male be one, you know PSA value is the indicator if your prostate is healthy or not. Your prostate value is at eight. Oh, I will not do this. I said, I want to have testosterone. No, you don't get testosterone. What, we can, what I can offer you, we make another biopsy, that would be the third in my case, and if you somehow can drop the value below three, I'm eventually willing to give you testosterone. I said, okay, do the biopsy. Guess what? Cancer. So, um, we decided, because it was a so-called easy-going cancer, not something severe, we rip out your prostate. That was in 2009. Okay, first mistake. Because my prostate cancer was not easy one. He was the highest level. It was level four. It was already cauliflower. So that ripped out my prostate and said, okay, you should be clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, second mistake. Quarter of a year later, they made a test again, PSA. Meanwhile, my PSA was at 18. Okay, and then we decided, okay, what is it? And then, um, to make a long story in this matter first, uh, short, we contacted the Cancer Center Treatment Center of America, and they said, come immediately, fly to us to Chicago, we'll uh, take care, we'll look at you. And they found, of course, out that my cancer had meanwhile spread in my lymph system. So uh, treatment was in that matter in 2010 was for two and a half months radiation accompanied with hormone ther therapy, not the one we take, the one which helps you against cancer. So it basically makes you a chemical eunuch. Now yeah, the issue or thing was the nurses and the doctor told me, okay, you will experience eventually a breast grow and eventually you will experience hot flashes like a woman. And I actually had to play a game. I was the first time in many years I was happy. I was happy and I had to pretend, okay, I can handle this. So I started with these uh, Lupron shots, with the shots to help me against the cancer, which is actually not a cure, it's only to, to postpone the cancer. And I could take it nearly a year, but the side effects were devastating. So um, I had to stop because one morning I was not capable to log in my PC anymore. And you must know I did 20 years of software development. I was one morning not capable to log in. I didn't know how to do this. So my wife fortunately uh, works also for Mercedes and we knew I was in a bad shape and said, what's going on? I said, I cannot log in. So we drove, that we drove to, to the emergency, and of course, they, they found out I couldn't speak anymore. I couldn't articulate. I couldn't really speak a word. So it was really severe. We had to stop the treatment with the hormone shots. They just gave me homorphine for two days to let me sleep. Of course, we had to stop the hormone shots. And then I became desperate. 
I want you to have the feeling of developing female breasts so badly that I uh, inter searched to research the internet to find a substitute, and I found it. Peraria mirifica. I took it for a few weeks because I felt so good and I could feel something and throw it away because of shame. And then after a few months, I bought again pills, took them for a few weeks, for a month or two, threw them away, and so on. Throw away, take, throw away, take away. Till 2013, in the summer, I was so desperate. I want to have female breasts so badly. I said, it doesn't matter what happened to me. I, I cannot take it anymore. So I was already depressive. I made a survey in the internet, and it said, you have to go immediately if you have to go to a psychologist. You are highly, let's say, committed suicide candidate. I said, no, I can take it. In August 2013, I had to go back again to the cancer center. I was always going to the cancer center two or three times a year. So, and voila, here we are. The doctor said, your cancer is back again. But we cannot do anything. We cannot see anything, but it's there. We have to wait till it grows. I said, excuse me. Yeah, we have to wait till it grows. So I have just to wait that it grows. If it's big enough, you can see where it is. So in that time, that was in fall 2013, I became suicidal. And um, I finally confessed to my wife. Um, I started being by with a psychologist uh, starting end of November 2013. and. Um, by uh, Christmas time, it was clear that I'm transgender. I came out um, to the company immediately after the Christmas vacation, a few weeks later, told my upper management in HR, hey, I'm transgender, I need your help, because I saw already, I wanted so desperately wear jewelry and wear makeup. So you can imagine my colleagues were already speaking behind me and making bad comments. I said, okay, you have to stop this. You have to make an active approach. You have to go directly to, to management, to upper management and speak with them to get support. Or you maybe you have to leave. So I did this and I said, okay, you can do this. Um, then last year, 2014, in June, after a fight also with legal, I had finally the permission to use the ladies, because I didn't want to go to the men's restroom anymore to apply makeup, to redo it, you can imagine. So anyhow, but this was so far the only support from my company. My wife, by the way, she was the first few months, she was very supportive. She helped me to get some clothes, and then she, she realized that I really want to go the whole nine yards. I really want, like Elaine did it already, I want to have surgery. And then comes the second question from my psychologist, my wife was there, asking me, could you imagine that you eventually become intimate with a male? And I said, yes. From that moment on, my beloved wife became extremely hateful. It was absolutely nasty. She didn't speak with me, she didn't look in my eyes, Within four weeks, she had her own house, she left, and I had to go to Germany, so in May, on June, last year, I was already divorced. And it, in, in comparison to Elaine's uh, relationship to her wife, I don't have any contact with my stepkids or with my wife. So I'm living alone uh, during the week, and uh, I'm still depressed but not because what I am, but I'm depressed because I don't have a family. My family, my natural family is in Germany, 8,000 kilometers away, and uh, well, yeah, here I'm pre basically pretty much alone during the week. Thank you very much for listening.
Okay. Um, I, <laughs> I know what my purpose is now, you know, here with my ministry. I know what God kept me here for, for my ministry to grow and to get bigger and better and to prosper and to go out even farther. And that's what I aim to do with the help of God, and I'm going to do it. That's my, that's it. Pastor, may I address that? Anyone that understands what, what we go through physically, not the emotion, you've heard the emotion. Um, I've been on the table for electrolysis for 120 hours over the last couple of years. That's not fun. I've had the surgery. I had no problem with it. I'm fulfilled. I, it's, it's not, but you, those that, that understand what that surgery is, you go through something. The loss of your, uh, the loss of contact with your family. I made a choice many years ago to take care of my family, and I did. And I, I did it reasonably well. I was proud of that. Two years ago, a little less than two years ago, when I told them what I had gone through and what I was going to go through, they walked away. Why would anyone make a choice to, to go through that? And it, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, homosexuality versus heterosexuality he says well when did you know you were heterosexual you know people don't think about that and and so most of the time when when transgenders get together one of the first questions is well how old were you when you knew after that our lives are pretty much the same and it's almost irrelevant to discuss a whole lot of the the things that we've gone through so it's, it's, uh, it's, but you're exactly right. You see, only we can, can make our own destiny. One of my best friends, when I wrote him and told him um, what, I was go what I had gone through and now what I was going through, I got a very loving letter. And then about three or four days later, I got another letter and he said, well, one reason that your family and others are having trouble with this is because you made a unilateral decision. Well, folks, this isn't a Baptist church. She, that y y It's not a committee-driven thing. Why would I have a committee? And by the way, I am Baptist, and I do go to a wonderful church called Baptist Church of the Covenant. And I've, I've seen your pastor uh, visit there. Back here last summer, I, I saw you. It's a wonderful place. It's an accepting place, but but the point is, it's it's you know, it's it's our destiny. If my family chooses never to accept me, that's you know that's got to be their problem. Nobody gets to judge me but one. So thank you so much.
starting to hear stories of families who are being supportive of their very young children who are expressing that they feel uh, that they are the opposite gender than they, than they uh, were assigned at birth. And just how does it make you feel when you hear about these stories and how times are changing and how some it, families are responding differently? It's about time because when I was younger and I used to tell my parents, you know, who I was and stuff, they looked at me like I was crazy. As a matter of fact, they put me in this crazy house for like a month. When I first told them, they said that, you know, no, my dad was like, no son of mine is going to be, uh, you know, he said the F word. And he was like, it's just this gross, it's gross. And so they sent me to counseling. And like you said, it does take a lot of courage. It takes a lot of, um, I don't use that word. I can't use that. But it takes a lot of courage to get out there to do what we do, to live our lives like we do, and to be persecuted by sometimes by people for no reason. And um, in, the, in the gay community, I mean, people, just do stuff to you just to do stuff to you. And um, I know for me, I have done nothing but the utmost best, you know, as far as taking care of people. Like, we've taken care of families like, for the holidays that didn't have any Christmas, you know, didn't have a Christmas for their children. We took care of their kids. I've only always, me and John, have only did good. But, you know, we still run into people that want to keep us down, that want to bring us down. But trust and believe. That's not going to do that. That's not going to happen anymore. You know, all we can do is live our days day by day and put our trust in God and do what we can with what we got. And I plan to go nowhere but up. And that's my answer. Judy, Judy in answer to your question, the culture of the times play, has a lot to do with these families today that are listening to their children. When I was five years old, my expression was, I didn't get to wear a dress like the other little girls. But, the, but these children today, for some reason, they're saying, I'm a, li I'm a little boy or I'm a little girl. And they, they are, you know, the, you know it, it's really easy for the doctor, you know, at birth, and says, well, this is a boy or this is a girl. And, and, and then there is the culture of the times. Would have been tolerated. Not tolerated at all when I was a child. My father is an FBI agent would have lost his job. J. Edgar Hoover wasn't forgiving. But today we don't have that. Today there's, I, I, I don't know where the people are smarter, but at least the culture of the time. And, and I think a lot of the things that, that, the homosexual community has gone through over the last 20 years or so, maybe longer, have, have, have brought about some awareness. The Bruce Jenner interview the other night, I think is gonna do tremendous things as far as bringing awareness to, to our lives. Bruce Jenner and I are not that much different in age. I, I cried my eyes out while I was watching that interview because I knew exactly what he was what he was talking about. And I used the word he because right now he says that's what he still wants to use, that, that pronoun. Normally I would have said she. But but it's 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 culture. I think it's the culture of the times. And and unfortunately for me, now I'm sure that my grandchildren have heard the words transgender. I hate to think what their parents have said to them about me, uh, but, but I think young, young children today, and as, as they age, I think we're going to see change. There, there's a sea change going on in, in, this, in this world today over issues like this, and it's becoming more and more, and it's, and it's forums like this. I've been given the privilege in the last six months, I've spoken to the Hoover Police Department's crisis negotiating unit just a few weeks ago and, and spoke to them for almost two hours and, and took questions about suicide rate and depression and what do we go through uh, even when we're halfway through transition and, 
and then I've spoken to a couple of human sexuality classes at Auburn University down in Montgomery about transgenderism, and I spoke to a group at Troy that was made up of counselors, assistant district attorney, prison workers, and social workers about transgenderism. So you see, it's, it's becoming more and more prolific that we have this opportunity. And that's why I think for this opportunity today. The um, medical community and the psychiatrists, they've come a long way. Their understanding has come a long way. Um, but there's still more because I work with newborn babies. And a lot of times we have children that have ambiguous genitalia where years ago they would say, well, do you want a boy or a girl? And it was a choice that the parents had. I want a little girl, so therefore they give the little girl a feminine name. Unfortunately, it's not that easy because they have ambiguous genitalia, but they have hormones and genetics that are sending them to be an opposite sex. Now, the medical profession recognizes that now, and they advise the parents to give the child a name that could be either way. And they look at the child from the time they're born to the time they're around two years old. And they look at their genetics, they look at their hormones, they do the testing. If the testing says you're more female than male, then the parents go with female. So in that respect, the medical profession has come a long way. I had an opportunity a couple of weeks ago at my job because I work in a newborn intensive care unit. And we have a really neat um, counselor that, uh, not, well, she is a counselor, but she's also a pastor. And she comes through. And she was on vacation, so they sent this substitute guy through. Now, he came in and he prayed over the baby and I joined him in prayer because they all have their own little private rooms. And I joined him in prayer and then I walked out of the room and he followed me and he says, well, what do you think about these parents deciding what sex their child should, two-year-old child should be? And I said, excuse me? <laughs> and I said, and the doctors are going along with what the parents want. I said, there's a fact in here you don't know. You're not understanding. The parents have no right to choose. The doctors have no right to choose. It's the genetics and the hormones that dictate whether it's a male or a female, and then they will do the surgery. And I said, so you don't need to be telling people that these parents are choosing to change their child's sex out of the blue just because they want a girl or just because they want a boy. I said, that's not the way it is, and no doctor would do that. And I said, and I, I reported him to the head of the pastoral department because I don't know how many other people he had told that to. Because people are not educated. They don't know. So they would believe this guy. And I thought, why are you spreading something like this? This is, you're here as a pastoral person to support and pray. Suppose we had a set of parents that had just found out their child was neither male or female at this particular time, but it was their child and they loved it. And eventually it would be determine which sex it was prominent. So he was not doing what he should have done, and he was undereducated. So 
I think now he is educated, and I don't think that he will tell anybody else that. But did, did, did the medical the profession child. has come a long way. It depends, you know, the, on the child. If you're asking what age they can do this, is that what I'm hearing? But the reason why I ask you what you describe here looks a little bit like this uh, child is um, intersexed. Because if several parties have doubt, is it a girl or a boy, the child may have both, let's say, primary sexual organs. It can, yes. And, and then, and of over course, time, it's a matter of they should give the, t the child time to develop and then yeah. let the child make a choice. Let's see how it develops, how does it behave uh, socially and so how does it feel. And then eventually I would suggest, let's say, you know, f after a few years, to let the child decide, do you would like to be a boy or do you would like to be a girl? And then, then, not before that, Well, you would have to, I mean, for the doctors to go forth in and doing the surgical correction. Because with ambiguous genitalia, you can't tell. I mean, they don't have a penis, they don't have a vagina. It's kind of distorted. So, for that child, the testing, the testing has to come about to show if they're predominantly female or they're predominantly male. Yeah, but then, then the corrective surgery could never be, and the child would not, would always feel even more different because it neither has either genitalia. But yes, there are, it's which one is prominent. Yeah. She said one day, she said, well, you know, you've kind of, uh, you, you kind of took us by surprise because you are the, you're, you're the only, you're the only transgender in this church. I said, well, you don't know that. Thank you. Thank you. Because, because I'm the, I'm, 
I'm the, o I'm the only one she knows about. That's right. Well, I got a, an email from her the other day introducing me to a female to male that has been a member of that church for a long time and has now still a little undecided. You have to understand, female to male, the the gender reassignment it, it's it's not as it, it's 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 what word am I looking for? Well, it's much more complicated. It's it's just not as sophisticated, and and so she doesn't know whether she really wants to totally transition, but she knows that she hates her body. She's dressing like a male, haircut like a male. Uh, I mean, it's just a. It was in, so here we do have another one in the church that um, that no one knew about. So, I, you know, I mean, it's it's just that way. You're right. The 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 genie is kind of out, and and I think you're going to over the next couple. I don't think in my lifetime it's ever going to get totally acceptable. We thought that about uh, same-sex marriage. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about here on this earth. I, I don't. I, I just. I don't know, but but I do know that that over these last very short period of years, so much more has come out. There's more research. Uh, you know, there there is neurological research trying to determine did this did this happen even in the mother's womb? It was was the, a flood of hormones, or is there the super the super gene and in, in the chromosomal or super chromosome structure and what have you. there's a lot of things happening, but but um, but I think the, the while I worried a little bit about the Bruce Jenner interview and and the the, the 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 you know with that family and his fame and and these type of things, but I sat there and I listened, and I I have no doubt that Bruce Jenner is a true transgender no doubt whatsoever and and I but I, I had co some concern would would his celebrity get in the way well now I just hope that he's able to go through his full transition and get out of the fishbowl for a little while now, uh, that, that brings up a, a question for me there now you you um, have been through the full transi trans uh, tra uh, transition what about the ones who feel that way but don't feel they need to go through the full transition? In their stages about this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Well, I think, I think there are stages. You, you, run into, you run into a lot of things, and, and this subject came up with the police department the other day, wanting to know about, about the depression and about the suicide rate. And, and I guess what I would say is that, that there are, you have a lot of categories here. You have some that reach the point that, that they, they can be satisfied if they can just outwardly express themselves by dressing and, and if they can gain some acceptance. You see, the term transgender and the term transsexual, it's used interchangeably, but it's really not. Transgender is one that is basically they, they believe they believe they know that they are the one gender trapped in the body of the other, but they can basically be satisfied with just the outward expression, the dressing, and, and what have you. And that and that's over and above being a cross dresser. See, that's that's a whole nother thing. The transsexual whether they've had the surgery or not, they're looking toward the surgery. They, they have every plan to have it. The surgery is fairly expensive. And so you, you, get, you get those, again, economically trapped the way they've been emotionally trapped, and they just have trouble going, going forward with it because most of the time insurance doesn't cover this. Doctors, you know, the way insurance plans work today, if it's a twenty thousand dollar procedure, the doctor 
insurance company says, well, we'll negotiate this down to about four or $5,000. Well, I'm gonna tell you, those plastic surgeons are not gonna take four or $5,000. So, so, so they get economically trapped. So, so, it's, it's, um, so what do you do? You just, again, you just learn to survive a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit differently. I might have been, I'm, years ago, I might have been okay if I could have just dressed and lived this way. But when, but then I think our mortality starts catching up with us. And we think, if I'm ever going to do this, I have to do it now. And that's what Bruce Jenner said the other night. I would like to add information to what Elaine just said. Um, we have to follow a protocol, a so-called Harry Benjamin Code of Care. That means we as the ones who do transitioning and also all the medical uh, support people, so all the doctors. This, this code is international. It exists here. It also has to be followed in Germany, in India, and in whatever country you think about. That demands that you have to, first you have to have a test and to have a period of, let's say, adapting before you get permission to get hormones. Then you have to become on hormones and you have to live at least for one year on hormones, eventually longer, and you have to live in the other gender. You have to prove that you can live in the other gender. It doesn't matter when, during the day, during the night, socially you have, must be capable to provide your job. You still have a job. You have to have a, a social life. You should not be somewhere on drugs or alcoholics, so you must be mentally stable. So I did the first test uh, a few weeks ago. And in most cases, in most things, I was good, but I was not good when it came to depression. So I'm not there yet. So my psychologist is then so, okay, we have to work on your depressions. You need, as a transsexual, before you get permission to have surgery, you have to have two independent uh, specialist evaluating if you are stable socially and mentally and also financially that you can have transition or you have the reassignment surgery and many people like you see the statistics there are maybe homeless they lose their job or they start uh, taking drugs or they start getting alcoholic and so they feel also because of these reasons not only what Elaine said financially trapped, they cannot pay it, also because of the other reasons. So they have to stick with their old, not wanted genetics. Well, uh, when I look back at me, when I was real young, younger, I wanted the sex change. But as I grew older and a lady offered it to me, I had got so comfortable with myself like I was until I didn't want it anymore because self-acceptance is the key to anything. I have accepted me as I am, how I am, and I, I don't need no altering of whatever today. Although I'm not speaking against people who do want that, but I'm just all right with me like, just like I am today. <laughs> in, co in, co in comparison, in, co in comparison to Tasha, I would love to be a grand stepmother I, w if I would like to get married the fourth time, but this time with a male, and I want to have grandkids. This is what I want. So I really want to get intimate with a male, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not comfortable with what I am at the moment.
pray. God, we thank you. Thank you for these wonderful gifts that was here before us tonight that shared from their hearts and their innermost being. And God, I just pray that in the hearing we will honor them and we will make a conscious commitment that we will support our transgender sisters and brothers, and that we will affirm them, and that we will be on the cutting edge of reaching out beyond ourselves and bringing this good news that those who come behind us 
people have found his faith. For we pray it in your precious name. Amen. Mary, Mary, Mary. 